Uh, hi, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm an independent researcher in Cambridge, and I'm here to present our work, Three Sigma. Um, so I didn't know you were going to be here, or else I would have taken that off. But I track a lot of things by myself, but not nearly as many as you. Uh, I'm also top 1% Tetris player globally. Um, that becomes relevant in a second. <laughs> uh, I used to be a kid, and I was on Facebook, and I found this great game. It's called Tetris Friends. And it's sort of like normal Tetris, but you like fight each other. So whenever you clear lines, it gets sent to that other person, and then you're trying to like you know destroy them. Uh, at the time I was playing this, there were a lot of like people that I considered bots because they were really good at this. Uh, I, it wasn't until I got older and got better like reflexes and stuff that I also got really good at this. Uh, for instance, here's my improvement graph. So this was the journey to getting to one percent, uh, and this represents ten thousand games of Tetris that I played, uh, probably at twenty eight by now. Because the last day from like a year, like a year and a half ago. So the really cool thing about this is that I got good at this in college, and and they give you a bunch of stats, right? Like how fast you complete it, uh, how efficient you are when you play, uh, all this stuff. And at the same time, I was playing Tetris. You know, I was also doing homework and stuff. I was in college. Uh, so this is a common graphic, right? And I think most people just uh, you know fuck the sleep, like. Whatever. And my mom was like, you know. You should sleep more. Uh, obviously, she's gonna say that because she doesn't have fun with friends or get good grades. Uh, she <laughs> yeah, sees me as suffering, or whatever. <laughs> but you know, I was like, nobody ever questions that, right? Your mom tells you stuff, you're just like, uh, I guess so, right? Uh, but I actually had my sleep data from my Fitbit, and I had all the Tetris data from the website, right? <laughs> So I got on my computer, I put out some notebooks, and then I was like, boom, big correlation. Absolutely nothing. I was like, this is like super no correlation. Uh, it was really disappointing. But actually, this was great because it meant I could be like, hey mom, obviously, if I'm going to be a pro Tetris player, it doesn't matter how much I sleep. Because no matter how much I sleep, you perform the same in Tetris. Pretty good. <laughs> About two years later, I got an Apple Watch, you know, time passed, I slept several nights, and I remember like, during this time, um, and I was like, okay, let's do this again. So this time I was like, no more random association, I want to see some real numbers. So one thing I looked at is, how does my touch performance change as I sleep differently? Like, like when I wake up, how does it change throughout the day? Uh, and so actually this reflects like sort of your energy cycle throughout the day, right? So over here is like when I just woke up, I'm kind of groggy for a couple hours, you see that? And then towards the end of the day, you see there's a drop off, and then somewhere in the middle, there's like, you know, a decrease in energy. I'm sure we've all experienced like post lunch coma. Um, but what I really was curious about was is my sleep, uh, does my sleep affect this curve? And so I split it by a rolling average of how much I slept in the past week. Uh, I found something pretty sad. Uh, turns out you do need to sleep more to do well in Tetris. <laughs> so over here, the orange line is. Um, Sorry, the y-axis here is how fast I'm playing. This is a pieces per second, so it's you know pretty much how fast you're uh, going. And this is like a good measure of performance. And so the higher is better on here. And you see the orange line. Obviously, uh, you do much better if you sleep more. Uh, you know, everyone kind of knows that. <laughs> um, but the, the, what I really learned about this was that like you know to prove your mom wrong, you need data. And you, not only do you need data, you kind of need a lot of data. Uh, like almost no one else I know plays Tetris. Uh, so no one has like a cognitive proxy with which to refute their mother, right? Uh, but I collect like all this data, like I have my location, I used to take my grip strength, I track when I take medication, I have my air quality, I have Spotify. Um, and even if you're not going to analyze this data, like it's nice to collect it, because at some point you're going to have like God AI and they're going to go on and look at your data and be like, you should eat more potatoes if you want to get stronger or something. Um, Oh yeah, sure. If so, if Tetris versus sleep requires like a bit of analysis. Like this took me maybe like three or four hours of coding, just because like the data is in a weird format. You gotta like collate it correctly. You gotta make sure the numbers aren't like fake. Uh, if you do everything, like it's gonna take a ton of analysis. And so I just didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, so my project for this hackathon is called Three Sigma. Basically, it's a black box. You take all your data, uh, you shove it in this thing, and it automatically puts out all the analyses for this thing. Um, so we haven't written like the entire suite of statistical tests. Obviously, there's like all sorts of things you could do. I'm just doing simple correlation uh, and correlation conditioned on something. These are the two things that I'm pretty interested in. Uh, and to avoid inundating you because you have like n cross n data points, right? Uh, we're only taking the statistically significant ones and then showing you like, oh, maybe this would be interesting for you. So the way this works is you can take all your data from these services. Fantastic! You can download them. You know, thanks to Europe, you can like access your data and it's easy to download. 
uh, one nice thing they've done. But the issue is that they're all in like different formats. Like my Tetris, I scrape manually, so it's in a text file. Apple Health gives it in JSON. Spotify gives it in JSON. All this stuff is different. The headers are different. So the first thing you do is standard, standardize all the file formats. They're all CSVs now. Now, when you look at them, the machine has no clue what these are. For instance, like the type here is always data. So they don't actually, we don't actually care about that one, right? So what I have is, uh, for each of your data sources, you label the column with like an X. That's a thing that you can change. Or you label it with a Y. This is a thing that is a result of your environment changing. Uh, and then you take your magical black box and you shove all your data into it. So I've only done a bit of my data uh, because I didn't, uh, there are some parsing format like problems with the other data, which I didn't get to handle. Uh, we just tested on a small amount of my data. Uh, so the first, like well, some of the interesting outcomes, uh, for instance, this glucose versus heart rate. So when you eat, like your body has to work to digest it, right? Uh, so this, this correlates, and the, the p-value is pretty good on here. Another interesting thing was I found that like uh, my Ritalin blood concentration uh, correlated with my Tetris performance, which, which is <laughs> good, good evidence that it does something. Uh, the blood concentration Take here is time. taken from my dosing time, and then like there's an exponential up and exponential down depending on the drug half-life, which you can, you can calculate that. Uh, and so these are some interesting outcomes. So the point of this is not that like I can analyze my data, right? Um, like the outcomes of this, like to me, are just really cool. But what we're really optimizing for are like things like people with debilitating allergies that they don't know about. Like I saw on Twitter recently, some guy was like, "Oh, I discovered I was allergic to potatoes, but only a little bit." So like, whenever he ate potatoes the next day, it would be like awful, and he'd be like, "What is happening?" Uh, and then over time, he would track himself on this stuff, and then it would find this this allergy for him. Uh, and other stuff is like, you know, these people recommend you all sorts of supplements and, and things like magnesium or B12. Like, nobody checks and then they take 50 of them. And like, it's just like the worst science I've ever seen. Uh, and it really reminds me of like, back in the day, they're just like, this stuff really, really works. This guy's like a real doctor and he can sell you some like, made up stuff. <laughs> um, and I want to know what actually works. Like, what actually works. So the, by making this analysis really easy, I want to make it possible for us to actually grab a lot of people's data uh, about what kind of supplements they're taking, and then try to isolate the effects of each of those. Uh, and the last thing is like, you know, health is actually not super solved. For instance, uh, here's my mom. Uh, she had some heart palpitation problems. Uh, she went to the doctor, and they're like, oh, okay, we'll take an EKG. Took an EKG, looked normal. Um, and doctor was like, yeah, looks normal. <laughs> 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 but she still has heart palpitations, right? Like, what is causing this? Is it the sodium? Is it the way you sleep? Is it the things you do as exercise? Like, we actually do not have this data. And even if in clinical trials, you cannot access this data at such a granular level that you really want to. Uh, for instance, like, here's the, the best, like, wearable EKG. It's like a sticker. It lasts, I think, a day or two. And it gives you, like, nice data, like, every minute or something. Um, but you know you have to charge it, you have to replace it, it's sticky, it like gets in the way. Um, so one way I think that we can go towards a better like a better way of measuring this data so we can have some reproducible interventions uh, is implantable devices. So I've been working on medical implants for a, a while now. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the projects I worked on was transferring power through the body and another one is like I want to hack a CGM to power it using solar. Uh, like, Power is like the main problem for implantable devices because uh, you, need, you need to put the device in a place which is big enough to accommodate a battery. Um, but if you can get power to the device where the device can harvest its own energy, then you don't have to worry about that. Now your problems are chemical and, and biological. But I don't know anything about those. So I'm just an electrical engineer. Uh, so I'm working on really long-term energy harvesting sensing implants in order to collect this data. Um, and so what I want to do with this is I want to prevent bad surprises and enable more good ones. Uh, and that's the goal of this analysis. Uh, Just questions. <laughs> there was questions. That was, that was great. Uh, no, no questions. It was great. How, how feasible is it to make a solar power CGM? And could you use any other, like even biological power source? So there's like glucose-based solar sources, like glucose-based power sources, which draw from blood sugar. But they're not really good. Yeah. Uh, solar is definitely sufficient on like a one centimeter by one centimeter panel uh, to power a CGM. Um, the question is more like, does the glucose oxidase break down? Uh, but definitely, like electrically, we can do it. It just no one has. Cool. Why well, not focus on urine and poop? So non-invasive, don't have to worry about. So uh, you know, I'm self-financed, so I don't have like a ton of like free income to do like stuff 
regularly. I would love to actually do it, but uh, mainly it's a, a question of money. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely interesting. I mean, ideally, if Theranos wasn't like fake, we could have this every day <laughs> at home, but, you know, unfortunately. All right. That's it. Any other questions? Yes.